Everybody, we are reading A Long Way to Chicago, and we are on Chapter 5, or the year 1933, The Phantom Brakeman. Now that Grandma's the only thing that reminded us of home in Chicago was knee-high. That was orange pop, and it was a nickel a bottle. While the 25 cents a piece that Dad gave Mary Alice and me, we could, with the 25 cents that Dad gave Mary Alice and me, we could each buy five knee-highs during our week, if we could slip off from grandma's long enough to get our allowances spent. The coffee pot cafe kept the knee highs along with the grape bats and the Dr. Peppers in a sheet metal vat of ice water with a bottle opener hanging down on a piece of twine. Grandma said she didn't like the knee high because the bubbles in it gave her gas. Mary Alice said anything that cost money gave grandma gas. We made ourselves scarce that first summer and afternoon and headed uptown before grandma could find us some chores. I was 13 at last, so I thank you just to call me Joe, not Joey. And I'd walked a few stitches ahead of Mary Alice. For one thing, she'd been talking dance lessons all year and never went anywhere without her tap shoes in a drawstring bag. The greatest movie star in history was sweeping the country at that time, a girl younger than Mary Alice named Shirley Temple. Shirley could sing and act and she was a tap dancing demon. Every girl in America was taking tap to be the next Shirley Temple. Though Mary Alice was getting a little too leggy to be a child star, mother said taking tap would give her poise. So Mary Alice was apt to stop cold on a sidewalk and turn through a tap routine in regular sandals. I wasn't going to wait while she did that, so we each acted like the other one wasn't really there. The only people in the coffee pot were a couple of farm women passing the time of day, like Mrs. Ike Kripe. As proprietor, Mrs. Kripe, wore a crocheted handkerchief pinned to her hairnet, pinned to her apron and a hairnet. She saw us come in. First, the screen door closed behind me. Then it opened again and Mary Alice made her entrance. You could tell that Mrs. Kripe wanted our nickels before she finished the farm, before we fished the farm women. What? You could tell that Mrs. Kripe wanted our nickels before we fished the knee highs out of the water. Oh, there we go. She was deep in conversation with the farm woman, but when I started to put my nickel on the counter, her palm was outstretched to take it. Above the wall was a framed picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who'd beaten out Hoover as president of the United States. He hung between two signs. Double yolk breakfast served all day with sausage, bacon, or ham. Your choice, 20 cents. And... Blue plate special, liverwurst or tuna sandwich, cup of coffee thrown in, 10 cents. Mrs. Kripe and the farm woman were remarking on what handsome men Franklin Delano Roosevelt was. Don't it beat all how a man that good looking would marry a wife that plain, said one of the farm women who'd known a thing or two about plainness. That Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt is plain as a mud fence. Maybe she's a good cook, said the other farm woman. Kissing don't last, good cooking does. Mrs. Kripe rang up the two nickels sales on the register. Men don't have any idea about women, she said. This big statement quieted the farm women. Then Mrs. Kripe said, they're cousins, you know. Who is? The Roosevelt. He married his cousin. The toothpick stopped dead in the farm women's mouth. You don't mean that. It was in the paper, Mrs. Kripe reached under her apron to adjust a strap. Was it legal? A farm woman whispered. I couldn't say, Mrs. Kripe replied. Them Roosevelt's isn't Illinois people. Their voices dropped lower. I noticed before marrying your cousin was a touchy subject around here, but now it was time for our knee highs. Half the pleasure was sticking your arm in the shirt sleeve and up to the shirt sleeve and fishing in the icy water for a bottle. Mary Alice plunged in at her end and we took our time. In those days before air conditioning, just getting one arm cooled off was a treat. We elbowed aside the grapettes. You didn't get enough for your money with the grape ep, and it left your mouth purplish, and the Dr. Peppers tasted like cough medicine. When we had our knee eyes in hand and opened, Mary Alice took a booth at the back. I settled at a table with the checkerboard in the front window. In the past, Mrs. Kripe had a fry cook and another lady working at the counter, but she was down to herself now, except for the girl who was wiping the tables with a wet rag. You had to look twice to see her. She was that skinny and as pale as a ghost. A light breeze would have blown her back into the back room, but she was keeping busy. She went at the tabletops like she was killing rats. 
When she worked her way to Mrs. Alice's, to Mary Alice's booth, they fell into a murmuring conversation. Mary Alice took out her tap shoes to show her, so it must be girl talk. I was glad to be here away from it. I was coming to the age where I didn't know how near girls I was supposed to be. Mrs. Cripe didn't ring up a sale after the farm women left, so they may have come in just for a couple of toothpicks. I was making my knee high last. Then from my seat in the window, I saw a woman pull up out front. She dropped down from a buckboard and tied her old mule to the rail. The mule wore a straw hat and the woman wore a sunbonnet. She was the toughest looking woman you ever saw. She made Mrs. Ike Cripe look like a movie star. Stomping through the front door in a pair of unmatching shoes she made for the cash register. For a bad moment, I thought she was going to hold up the place. Well, Ms. Eusebanks, Mrs. Cripe said, what is it? The sunbonnet woman, Ms. Eusebanks, stuck a grubby paw under Mrs. Cripe's nose. Let me have my girl's wages. She jerked her head to the back booth where the wispy girl was lingering at Mary Alice's tables. I give her 15 cents already today, Mrs. Cripe said. You done paid her before she worked out her day? Mrs. Eubanks was confounded. A fool and her money is soon parted. She headed for the wispy girl whose eyes looked hunted and scared. Grabbing the front of the girl's uniform, she said, give me that 15 cents or I'll turn you every which way but loose. The girl hung there in her mother's grasp. Mary Alice sat below them, stunned. In a small voice, the girl said, I need my money. You don't need to have no needs except I say so. The woman barked nose to nose with her. Cough it on up. When she turned her loose, the girl reached down as slow as she dared and took something out of her shoe. It must have been a full 15 cents because Mrs. Eubanks' hand closed over it, making a fist, and she shook it at the girl. And when you get home tonight, I'll take you back, back wages out of your hide. Girl, you won't sit down till the first frost. I know what you're up to, Missy. You're sly, but you don't put nothing over on me. She stalked out of the place, past Mrs. Cripe, who hadn't liked being called a fool. The girl stood beside Mary Alice, trying not to cry. Mary Alice reached up to touch her hand. She was trying to say something to make the girl feel better, but I didn't look or listen. I didn't know what to do. Pretty soon we started for home. I'd left some knee-high in the bottom of the bottle, and I think Mary Alice did too. We walked together now. I waited while she stopped on an unbroken slab of sidewalk and went into one of her tapped steps. She held her skirts out in the Shirley Temple way, but her heart just wasn't in it. She was just going through the motions, and her mind was somewhere else. Who was that girl anyway, I finally asked. Vendilia Eubanks, she said. That old cow in the bonnet is her mother. She wants to rule Vendilia's life. I shrugged. Well, she is her mother. She's her jailer, Mary Alice said. Bedelia's 17. 17? She doesn't even look 12. A starved 17, Mary Alice said, and she needs a friend. Then her jaw clamped shut in Grandma's own way, and she didn't say anything else all the way home. When we got there, Grandma was out in the yard standing over a thing that made out, made out of lumber in the shape of a teepee. Nearby was a pile of stove lengths on the circle of burned ground where she cooked down her apples for apple butter. She waved us over. We're making soup. Until we started coming to grandma's, we thought soup was a pink, oh, soap. Sorry, soap. We thought soap was a pink bar that came out of a wrapper la labeled cashmere bouquet. But that cost seven cents. And grandma made her own. She soon had us busy as bird dogs. She sent Mary Alice to the pup for pail after pail of water, and she sent me to the house for coal scuttles full of wood ash from the kitchen stove. Grandma poured the water through the teepee, which was a hopper. When it dropped through the ash, it came out as lye. Grandma caught it in the pan. We worked till supper time, and before we went inside, she built up a big fire from the stove lengths and the shavings. After supper, Grandma and I worked through what she called the cool of the evening. Mary Alice had managed to vanish, but the heavy work was over. The fire had burned down just right. Over the glowing embers, Grandma put an old pot on a tripod. We dumped the lye into it with just the right amount of water. Now she added what looked to me like garbage. Ham skins, bacon rinds, and things too mysterious to even mention. We took turns stirring the witch's brew as darkness crawled across the yard. The blossoms on the morning glory vine were tight blue fists, and you could hear husky sighing from the cornfield across the fence. Grandma looked up, far out to the west, down where the road and the washbosh tracks seemed to meet. 
She scanned the far horizon, maybe waiting for me to ask what she was looking for. What are you looking at, Grandma? The brakeman, she said, still scanning. You mean a brakeman off the Wabash Railroad? She nodded. This is about the time of evening he's been known to show. Who is he, Grandma? She turned to me. You mean you never heard the story? She took over the stirring, turning the paddle with both hands. It happened back in 1871 and all come to pass because of the great fire of Chicago. The town of Decatur was sending a special train full of volunteers to fight the fire Mrs. O'Leary's cow started. Of course, railroad signals were very simple in them early times and it was a foggy night. Somehow the train full of fire freight, firefighters got on the same track as the Wabash freight line. They met head on. It was just half a mile along them tracks down by the stand of timber on the way to Salt Creek. Grandma nodded at the end of the timber, a dark smudge in the distance. Killed a brakeman on the freight train and both engineers. Oh, you never saw such a mess. Grandma shook her head. I was only a babe in arm, but I remember it well. My ma walked those tracks down there and held me up to see it. They pried the locomotives apart and taken out the dead, but it was a sight to behold. They said the dead bodies looked like they'd been fed through a sausage grinder. I swallowed hard, but I was always interested in anything from her early life that might explain grandma. The paddle in her hand turned slow as the foul brew, in the foul brew as she looked down into the dark woods. Unfortunately, that wasn't the end of the story. She glanced my way. The brakeman's been seen since. The darkness deepened around us and a star or two came out. The brakeman who got chewed up like he'd been through a sausage grinder? Grandma nodded. Years go by without a sighting, then on a hazy night, Somebody will see the brakeman down there between the rails, swinging the old time railroad lantern, or they'll spot the dim yellow light deep in the timber, like he's a wandering soul still trying to head off the oncoming train. Grandma, I said in a breaking voice, though my voice was just starting to break anyway. Are you talking about the brakeman's ghost? She pursed her lips to give a considered opinion. I don't want to say one way or the other. All I know is some people won't go down that road after dark by themselves. Grandma got hiked her skirts up to keep them out of the fire and the glowing embers made them hot as noon. But goosebumps popped out on my arms. Of course I'm talking about ignorant people, Grandma said. Superstitious people. I had some trouble settling down that night. It was the first night of the visit, so that was normal. But every time my eyes closed, I saw the phantom brakeman with the hamburger meat for a face swinging a ghostly lantern through tree branches like skeletons. So I was up and down. As bad luck would have it, my bedroom window looked west to the haunted woods. I kept getting up to look in case a lantern was swinging in the trees, but I didn't see anything. I was no sooner asleep than I was awake again. Some sound had woke me. I didn't move in my bed, hoping not to hear any more. But I heard some snuffling, like crying, and it seemed to come from Mary Alice's room. I thought I heard a voice, too, not just a few words, though she never talked in her sleep. Now I was both awake and the goosebumps were back. Wearing only my BVDs, that's his underwear, I got up and looked into the hall. Mary Alice's door was shut tight, though we never closed our bedroom doors hoping for a breeze. I crept over, but I didn't try the knob. There was bound to be locked, and I rapped lightly. This brought forth a little startled yippling sound from inside. Quicker than if I'd awakened her, little feet padded across the creaky floor. Her keyhole spoke. What? Mary Alice, are you alone in there? Who wants to know? Who do you think? Are you? No, she said, and don't whisper so loud. Who's in there with you? A puppy. A puppy? I said, where'd you get a puppy? The cop house. You don't go in the cop house, I said. He came out. He followed me home. I'm calling him Skipper. That's what you're hearing, Joey. Don't tell Grandma she doesn't believe in indoor pets. I gave up, though I didn't quite believe in her pet either, Skipper or whoever. But I was too tired to argue. I went back to bed and I slept like a log. Grandma had already eaten her breakfast, and she was at the stove fixing ours. Sausage patties, which reminded me of the break man, and buttermilk biscuit and fried eggs over easy. Mary Alice turned up promptly, looking perky and innocent. I remembered Skipper. When Grandma's back was turned, Mary Alice broke open a biscuit and stuck a sausage patty inside it, and then she pushed it down her skirt. She knew I was watching, but she didn't meet my eye. The eggs were runny, so that was a problem for her. She thought about making an egg sandwich to go with the other biscuit, but gave it up. When Grandma turned back to the table, Mary Alice had Mary Alice had licked her platter clean. She skidded out of her chair and was gone back upstairs. Grandma gave her departing figure a long look. She mentioned that the night air would cool her brew to soap, so we went outside to see. 
The embers were white, and sure enough, the pot was solid with soap, or something like soap. It reminded me of the cheese she fed the catfish, and it didn't smell that much better. My job was to pry it out of the pot. Grandma hunkered in the grass with a butcher knife to carve it into cakes. There's this here's good soap, she remarked as she went at it with the knife. It lathers good and it'll take the top layer right off your skin. The sun hadn't been up too long when the morning glories were just beginning to unfurl. Then far down the road, a cloud of dust appeared, heading for town. Nearer it was Ms. Used Banks and the sunbonnet on and the strings on her sunbonnet flying. She was standing in the buckboard with a whip in her hand. She had her straw, old straw-headed mule was galloping, and I'd never seen a mule break into a trot, let alone a full gallop. That buckboard sped past the house, never slowing for town. Grandma stood up to watch it pass, fingering her chins thoughtfully. She gave me the chore of scraping out the soap pot, which looked like a long day's work. I had to roll the pot in the grass and climb halfway in with the wire brush to loosen the clinging soap. It was a mean job, and some very strange-smelling stuff had gone into that soap. Grandma had said that full recipe for it would die with her. Grandma had said that the full recipe for it would die with her. In an hour's time, I hadn't made a dent in it. By then, Mary Alice had come out of the back porch wearing her tap shoes, and she began to run through one of her routines, calling out her steps. Shuffle ball, change, step, step, shuffle ball, change, step, step. I was scraping away on the pot, and she was tapping away on the porch, and if you ask me, she was acting entirely too innocent. We heard the clopping of hoofs and a jangle of harnesses, and here comes Miss Eubanks in her buckboard, back from uptown. She swerved into Grandma's side yard and drew up. The old mule was foaming at the mouth and looked near death. Its straw hat was hanging from an ear. Miss Eubanks dropped down and lit running. She pounded on the back door, shoving Mary Alice aside, but even Miss Eubanks didn't quite dare to storm into Grandma's house. She gave the screen door a savage rattle, though. Grandma appeared big behind the screen wire. Well, Adelia, she said, what have you got your burr under your tail about? Ms. Eubanks was wheezing. She turned up her sleeves and on her feed sack dress. I need my girl back. You got her in there. What have I got that's yours? Grandma queried. Adelia, you got her. She didn't come home last night and she ain't at work today. She was seen coming in this house. That girl done brought her in. Ms. Eubanks poked a finger in Mary Alice's face, which was frozen with fear. I was observing the scene over the rim of the soap pot, and I was all eyes. Who'd seen her come in here, Grandma said. I didn't. Everybody in town, Ms. Eubanks said. Grandma nodded. She knew everybody knew everything, often before it even happened. Well, let me tell you how it be, Adelia, Grandma said in a reasonable voice. If you want to search my house, you'll have to get past me, and I'll tell you something else for free. If you set foot over the door sill, I'll wring your little red neck. Ms. Eubanks made one of her fists and seemed about to put it through the screen door. She was dancing with rage. With a strangled cry, she dashed off the porch, heading for the buckboard. Her old mule saw her coming and he sighed. She rattled off the property and Mary Alice stood there on the porch, wilting. Things quieted down after that. Grandma disappeared from the screen door. I went back to scraping the pot and pretty soon Mary Alice went back to practicing her tap, but real slow and her timing was all off. By noon, I knocked off work for a stop at the privy before dinner. I was almost in it when the only thing on my mind was something moved in the cob house door. Somebody was there, and he stepped out into my path, and I nearly jumped into the priv jumped over the privy. It was a guy in a tight suit, a high collar, and a silk necktie. I'd seen him uptown, but he couldn't put a name to him. He looked over at me, and he decided I was old enough that he'd have to deal with me. Junior Stubbs, he said, putting his hand out to shake. Ah, I said, could you wait a minute? When I came out of the privy, he gave me a business card that said, Stubbs and Askew, General Insurance Agents, Wind and Fire Coverage, Our Specialty. I'm in business with my daddy, he explained. Merle Stubbs. I fingered the card. I doubt my grandma's in the market for any insurance. Mr. Dodley said, oh, no, you can't sell her anything. He had a jiggly Adam's apple, I noticed. I happened to be passing, he said, between the cob house and the privy. Ah, uh, well, no, he looked down at his shoes. I was holed up in here to tell you the truth. I'm on my lunch hour. You got Vidalia Eubanks in your your house, am I right? Everybody says so, I said. Why, do you want to sell Vidalia some insurance? No, he said, I want her. I blinked in the midday sun while he waited for me to work this out. Could you get a message to Vidalia? He asked, pulling out another one of his cards. You can read what's on the back of it just to show you I mean business. 
I turned the card over and read, Come steal away with me, sweetheart. Let nothing no longer keep us apart. Break yourself free of your mother's rule. She never knew love, and she's just being cruel. I love you, honey. Junior. My ears burned like fire. Now I was 13, and it took less than this to embarrass me. Do your best, he said. It's now or never for me. If her old ma gets her home again, I'm a dead duck. Tell Vidalia I'll be back in the cob house tonight by dark with hope in my heart. Then Junior cut out, and I watched him scale Grandma's back fence in his suit. By mid-afternoon, I'd done all that I could do on the soap pot, and a nickel was burning a hole in my pocket. I was thinking hard about an e-high. But before I could make my escape, a car pulled up in front of Grandma's house. A 1930 Ford Model A sedan. A lady and a man got out and started up the front walk. I went in the kitchen door, not wanting to miss anything. Grandma was already at the front door, and Mary Alice was hanging around the foot of the stairs that led to the bedrooms. I palmed Junior's poem to her, and she stuck it down the front of her shirt where the sausage sandwich had gone earlier. Junior will be at the cob till my nightfall, I murmured. And Mary Alice nodded. Whatever you're selling, Merle, Grandma was saying at the front door. I don't want any. Mr. Merle Stubbs and his wife overflowed the front door. Now, Mrs. Dowdle, I'm not here for my professional capacity. I took time off work and brought Miss Stubb with me to have a friendly word with you. They got their feet in the door and Grandma let them take chairs at the front room. What do you want, she said, not sitting. Nothing in the world but to chat with you on a private matter. Mr. Stubbs shifted one leg over the other. There's no private matters in this town, Merle, Grandma said. Everybody's private business is public property. Yes, and you've stuck your nose in ours, Mrs. Stubbs said, speaking up sharp. You got that Eubanks gal upstairs this minute. Mrs. Stubbs glared at the ceiling. She's trying to steal my son and you're helping her out. She's gotten away from her ma, so she's halfway there. Grandma's spectacles flashed her a warning, but Mr. Stubbs said, Now Mrs. Stubbs is upset and her and off her feet about our boy Junior. He's lost all his judgment and he wants to marry a Eubanks. Do tell, Grandma's big arms were folded in front of her. So what? We got a position in this community, Mr. Stubbs said. We don't need a concoction such as the Eubankses. I'm a Democrat as the next, Democratic as the next guy, but there's limits. Besides, Adelia Eubanks is half cracked and it could run in the family. Think of the children. Have you talked it over with Junior, Grandma asked. You can't talk sense to him, Mrs. Subs replied. He's bewitched. Mary Alice and I lurked near, taking in every word. About the only thing Vidalia and Junior had going for them as a couple is that they weren't cousins. A thud occurred then. Mary Alice and I both heard it. Something hit the outside of the house. Nothing loud, just a thud. Grandma heard. She began to drift towards the front door, but she went on talking to the Stubbses. Well, it's no skin off my nose, she said calmly. But seems like your boy's old enough to make up his old nine. How old be he? Thirty, Mrs. Substead. But he's a young thirty. Grandma was at the front door and she pulled it open and stalked outside. We all followed her naturally to find her in the middle of the yard with her hands on her hips, staring at the back of the house. A ladder had appeared, propped up against the sill of the upstairs bedroom window. And on the top of the ladder was Miss Adelia Usebanks in her sunbonnet. She was working away, trying to jimmy loose the catch on the window screen. Grandma gazed. Of all the invasions of her property, this one took the cake. For the love of Pete, Mrs. Stubbs looks up, shading her eyes. It's that trashy Eubanks woman trying to get her girl back. I hope she does. I hope she takes her home and sticks her down the well. Ms. Eubanks had to notice the yard below had filled up with people, but now she had the screen loose and was ducking under to get inside. She had one knee on the sill. That's as far as she got. Grandma strolled over and took the ladder in both hands. She jerked it free of the ground and it fell, scraping down the house. It must have seemed to Ms. Eubanks that the world may have dropped out from underneath her. She had one knee on the window sill, and the rest of herself was in space. She grabbed the window screen and it came with her as she fell. She was in the air a long moment turning as she dropped, legs working hard, and then she crashed through the snowball bush, still clutching the screen. Jump a Jehoshaphat, Mrs. Stubbs cried, and she's not insured. The top of the nodding snowball had snagged her sunbonnet, but Miss Eubanks herself was down among the roots. She beginning to crawl out from under the bushes that had broken apart, broken her fall. Again, she was wheezing. Forgetting their differences, Mr. Stubbs would have gone to her aid, but Mrs. Stubbs took him in hand and headed to their ford. Over her shoulder, Mrs. Stubbs called back, I hope this puts an end to this entire unfortunate business, and I don't want any more interference from you, Mrs. Dowdle. Get in the car, Lula. Lula, Mr. Stubbs said. 
and they gunned away as fast as the Ford could go. Ms. Eubanks sat in the yard, dazed. Grandma stood above her. There's my property line, she said, pointing at it. Get over it. Ms. Eubanks slipped away, steaming. Where she parked her mule, I don't know if it was still, even if it was still alive. She turned around just off Grandma's territory. You done abdicated my girl, she howled, but I'll get her back. You watch. I looked up at the bedroom window with the missing screen and a face appeared there briefly, ghostly pale. And it wasn't Skipper the puppy. By eight o'clock that night, the whole town knew everything. Defying his parents, Lula and Merle, Junior Stubbs was known to be in Grandma Cobb's house, Grandma's Cobb house, waiting to make his move. And Bedelia Eubanks, tucked away upstairs in Grandma's house, was ready to make hers, in spite of her half-cracked mother, Idalia. The Washbash Cannonball train was due through on its run between Detroit and St. Louis. It was going to make its usual stop at 817, and the runway couple were going to elope on it. Everybody said so. The Coffee Pot Cafe was doing its best business in several years because its front windows looked out on the depot. Word had spread. People had driven in from all over the country to witness the showdown. The Stubbs meant to be on that platform to talk Junior out of it, and the whole Eubank clans was coming in town to get Vidalia back. Nobody agreed on how many big brothers she had, but there were several. Things didn't go according to plan, though. When the Wabash Cannonball steamed in on schedule, the town bulged with people, but the Lovebirds, Junior, and Vidalia were absent. The cannonball pulled out without them, leaving Merle and Lula Stubbs and all the Eubankses milling on the platform. The train gathered speed past Grandma's house and Grandma sat there at the front door to see it go through. Mary Alice watched from an upstairs bedroom window. But then with the piercing shriek that rent the evening air, the powerful locomotive set its brakes. It skidded a quarter mile before it came to a stop. There was a little haze that night, a light mist. Down and back, swinging an old-time lantern, the phantom brakeman seemed to hover between the tracks, dimly bathed in the yellow lantern light. The engineer stuck his head out of the locomotive and stared down the track with widening eyes. Before he could send the fireman to investigate, the ghastly figure had vanished into the haze and melted into the mist. But it gave Vidalia and Junior their chance. They came up hand in hand from the other side of the Wabash tracks, and they scrambled aboard the open platform at the back of the parlor car. When the cannonball pulled out again, they were on it, together, at last. That was one night Grandma didn't have to wake herself up to go to bed. As I sat in the front room, she sat there in their platform rocker saying to Mary Alice, next time you bring a stray home, make it a puppy. Mary Alice stared. You can call it Skipper, Grandma suggested. How did you? I heard you tell your brother that Vidalia Eubanks was a puppy. I can hear all over the house. I got ears on me like an Indian scout, and I don't sleep. Grandma looked at me. Get everything squared away, she said. And yes, I had. I'd taken off Grandpa's Dowdle's big old black overcoat and put it back on the cob house with the old lantern where I'd found them. And that was the end of the year 1933.